guys, I hope you're all well and welcome to the Training Tippets podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy and it is fantastic to have you here with us today. This podcast episode is part two of a discussion with Nick Bishop. If you haven't listened to the first half already, you can listen to it and download it on animaltrainingacademy.com or on iTunes. We're going to jump straight back in where we left off in the last episode. Before we do though, just a quick recap with a little bit of information about Nick and then we'll get straight into it. Nick is a human animal fascinated with learning, behavior and the art of storytelling. He has worked in the zoo world for the past 20 years in Australia and overseas with a keen focus on birds and free flight presentations. These have blended with his background as an actor slash singer to see him working internationally in the field of nature theatre and free flight shows in Australia, the Middle East and the USA. His local career history includes stints at Zoo South Australia, Taronga Conservation Society in Sydney and Alice Springs Desert Park, as well as establishing a learning group called Behaviour Techs. Other pursuits include natural history illustration cartooning and storytelling as an actor slash singer in the Adelaide theatre scene. He is currently the manager of Nature Theatre at Zoo South Australia. Let's pick up where we left off last time. I'm loving all these stories. There's such great value and, and lessons in them and I'm still really pumped because we've got even more great stories to share. The next one, we're going to travel to, and once again, excuse me if I butcher the name here, Samburu Reserve in Kenya. That's and correct. Completely spot on. Fantastic. And <laughs> well, not only are we going to travel there, <laughs> we're going to talk about a bull elephant and positive punishment. Let's dive in. Well, in Samburu Reserve, I mean, this is one of the great things about seeing animals in the wild. And I just utterly encourage all of us to take an ethological approach to looking at animal behavior. There is so much of the artifact there is so much of the constructed in the interactions we have with animals in our homes, in our workplaces. The value, the importance of actually watching animals in the environment around them is just such an essential thing. Now, this one did actually involve interaction from this bull elephant with our vehicle. We were traveling along this creek line and we noticed an impressive animal with amazing ivory just foraging along this creek line. And we stopped to take photographs of him and we noticed, of course, that he was oozing a lot of temporal fluid. He was in fairly advanced muffs. So we were already a little bit on the alert that this animal could be behaving in a way that made him a little more dangerous, a bit more hazardous than usual. So there we were clicking away just entranced on this superb African morning. And for those of us who've traveled in Africa will know what I'm talking about, that when you're in an African morning, you really do feel like it is the first day of creation, if you like, if I can take some artistic license there. Beautiful conditions. This elephant, more quickly than we really could give the animal credit for, then left the creek bed and pretty much moved towards us with real deliberation. And before we knew it, he'd smashed through a fairly substantial tree and was right on the back of the vehicle. And I've never experienced an emotional sequence for myself quite like it of having been just in this state of reverie admiring this animal and then having basically my insides just liquefy with fear and being in this suspended state of noticing this imminent danger coming toward me in the shape of this huge grey mess with these two beady, very intent eyes beginning to make these extraordinary noises with his tongue trucked up and his ears flaring. And our driver did a very interesting thing at the moment. He actually spun his wheels in the dust and set up this huge cloud of dust onto this bull elephant. And this made absolutely zero impact with a result that then our driver, Sammy, floored it and basically dumped the vehicle forward away from this bull who followed us for a bit, then sort of diverted off and started to feed. But you know, the moment we stopped, he oriented back to us and came forward again. So we just got out of there. And it was only later that Sammy, a seasoned safari driver, admitted that that was one of the most frightening bull elephants that he'd ever come across and that he was going to be sharing news about that animal with all of his fellow drivers in the district. So what did we learn from that? Basically that behavior is situationally specific, that this animal in this state was not 
perturbed in any way whatsoever by that sardine can full of human animals flaring a poultry plume of dust up at him. And that some animals in some circumstances can become hardened to such stimuli, so much so that it becomes a prompt to actually increase the forward movement. And we also saw then the practice later that Sammy put in place of doing the same thing to, to younger elephants when they would approach the back of the vehicle. And indeed, these younger elephants would scat. They would move away from that. And he explained to us that the drivers have an agreement that they do this because they don't want to train elephants, young bulls, to follow vehicles or to chase them by moving away from them. They actually do want to put some kind of positive punishment on that event in the present moment. And to a degree, it works, but not necessarily for a bull elephant in must. So it pays us all to remember that when it comes to behavior, not all situations are created equal and that behavior changes with context. And so should we. And for all of us to remember that when you're dealing with wild animals, particularly creatures like elephants, you must remember how utterly vulnerable and frail you are. You might have a dramatic and impressive prefrontal cortex, but really in the face of an elephant with an agenda, it could end up being your last little bit of arrogance. Hey, cool. Thanks so much for sharing that story, Nick. And I want to build upon this now because I know it's something you're deeply passionate about. And I really want to spend way, way more time in the future learning about applied behavior analysis from watching wild animals. I, I think that's just such a great concept. Can you expand on this even more, Nick, and share your thoughts and feelings on this subject and maybe some more experiences? Yeah, I'd love to. You know, we think that you know, Skinner and Pavlov did a lot of the fundamental groundwork for us about how behavior works in controlled lab style environments but we also remember that groundbreakers like Nico Tinbergen and Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch were the first ethologists who indeed shared a Nobel Prize for their work in ethology. Von Frisch famously with the wiggle dance of bees and uh, dear to my heart is of course the work of Tinbergen who worked with Gulls and Lorenz who also observed geese. So they were really the founding fathers of ethology watching behavior in the field and learning about the way animals learn through interface with the environment. I think it's really important for uh, me to, to passionately stand by this really important area that we need to pay attention to. And all of us work in these environments where we get to have things very much our own way. We decide when the training session is going to be. We bring what we need to it. It's a very constructed experience. And there's a real danger in that, that we can grow a perception that training is centralized around that human animal, that human figure. But really what the animal is doing is using mechanisms that have been honed over eons. And I love Susan Friedman's teaching in her Living and Learning with Animals course about the fact that an animal approaches you from its evolutionary heritage, its individual history as a learner and indeed what's going on in the present moment. But I think it's evolutionary heritage is an important thing to know about. And just watching any animal have interface with the environment is so amazing. Once again, in Samburu, we were in the safari vehicle and came across this cheetah that was lounging in the grass under the shade of a shrub. And occasionally this cheetah would sit up, look around the environment. It was on a slope just in the foothills and the plains were stretching out before it. And then it would just languidly flop down again into the grass. A number of other vehicles drove past this cat but our driver just stayed with it and encouraged us to enjoy it and just take photos of this animal. And after a bit, what we noticed was that some white collared ravens and some hooded vultures flew in to the area and landed in the trees above this cheetah. It was absolutely amazing. I thought, what's going on here? Then this cheetah finally, after about 45 minutes worth of watching it, came forward, walked along the side of the safari van, and then at the end of it, walked down onto the plains. Now, we drove off on the road that we were on, and that swung around in an arc, kind of parallel to the forward movement the cheetah had taken. And then suddenly, this cheetah slunk down into stalking mode, followed by this explosive rush of cheetah action. And over the course of about 30 metres, covered the distance in next to no time, you know, when you see cheetah running in documentaries, it's tampered with, it's slowed down so you can appreciate the action. Nothing could have prepared me in that moment for how fast that animal could move. And it flushed a young Grant's gazelle from the grass and killed it immediately and ended up by that same piece of road, which swung in this convenient arc so that we could be right by 
by it as it killed this gazelle fawn. So as it turned out, what had been happening was that Nuchita had been watching Grant's gazelles out on the plane, had noticed a female put its youngster down in the grass, probably after having had a feed, to go off to do some more grazing. I think that those birds were watching this behaviour and of course they had a bird's eye view of the entire picture. And I think that animals learn how to watch each other, guided by the question, what's in it for me? And that white-collared raven, those hooded vultures, I think read accurately the scenario that was playing out below them. And then, of course, were in the prime position to take advantage of spoils to monitor that cheetah with that carcass so that they could therefore fly down and be positively reinforced with their vigilance. So moments like that in the field where there's layers of interaction are just extraordinary an amazing experience. But then taking it back home here to Australia and noticing one day while I was having a coffee in a cafe in the rocks when I lived in Sydney, a pair of rainbow lorikeets flew into one of the trees in this courtyard and right in front of me just flew down onto the table, totted forward, bold as, parrot movement on the ground is always so endearing. And lorikeets add all these really cool little hop skips and jumps to it as well. They truly are the clowns of the parrot set. And this lorikeet comes up to the sugar pot, takes a sachet of sugar, flies up into the tree, with it and then rips off the top and starts tilting the sachet forward and then licking out the sugar with its tongue. Now this was pretty nifty but even more amazing was the fact that it had its mate with it and what it would do when it would get a gob full of sugar for itself is that it would then hand the sachet over to its mate who would also help itself to a little sweet hit. So just watching the way animals say yes in the environment and taking advantage of whatever opportunities exist I think is a really really important thing. We see here you know a cheetah perhaps using our vehicle as a barrier to make sure it could move down along it to not be detected. We see the the lorikeet grabbing that sachet. Those are all contexts where there was some kind of human presence, some, some aspect of us in the environment that's used. But no actual direct training from us was needed to observe amazing things about applied behavior analysis, about the ABCs of learning in that moment. And I think what it really does is it serves to fully emphasize the subtle interplay of everything that's operating in an animal's environment to get learning to happen meaningfully, to improve skill to change behavior due to experiences pull chance so beautifully and simply says in learning and behavior and i think those are two of my my favorite examples of that the last one is driving on a very open country track towards a town called hamley bridge in south australia some years ago and coming across the figure of a black falcon that had just killed a galah in the center of the road and i thought well there's no way i'm going to leave that galah in the center of the road for that beauty to be knocked by a car so i got out of the vehicle and i just went around the front of the vehicle and this falcon just took off the bird went and landed on a fence post and just watched and this is the thing animals watch us we are just part of the potential for opportunity in the environment i just picked up the galah and i moved it into the verge of the road and threw it right into the grass so that this bird could feed right away from the road and then walked away and as i did so the bird just flew down onto that galah so there was just that beautiful dance between human animal and bird in that relationship at that moment just emphasizing observation bird seeing me initially as a a stimuli that might drive it away from the galah, but then watching to see what would happen. Staying on the fence post, obviously, he'd worked hard for that prize, and there was a lot of valuable food in that galah carcass. So remaining attached to that, being concerned about me, but the coolness with which this bird operated, and then flew gently back down onto the galah after I left. You know, valuable lessons like that every turn, if we care to open our eyes and observe. Just sparrows and pigeons on your city street, lorikeets in your street trees, kangaroos in a back paddock, wherever it's happening. Behaviour is the greatest show on earth that's got lessons to teach. If only we care just to watch in the field all the things we need to know to be successful trainers in our homes and in our facilities. Beautiful. And I'm so glad that we brought that up today, Nick, because we haven't really talked about that on the podcast before and you articulated it fantastically for us today. So thanks for that. And moving forward, what I thought we'd do here, if you don't mind, is tell everyone listening a little bit more about some of the stuff you 
you've been up to specifically a venture that i briefly mentioned at the start of this podcast called behavior techs now i've personally had the pleasure of being a participant of two separate behavior techs workshops and events once at the australian society of zookeeping conference in auckland new zealand in 2013 and also when we invited you out to wellington zoo whilst i was working there can you maybe elaborate on this for everyone and describe what behavior techs is all about behavior techs well it's a word sandwich basically combining architect and behavior and it was concocted in a discussion with my friend jim mckendry jim mckendry is one of the most amazingly insightful behavior guys i know he has a home in the noosa hinterland in queensland and he lives in a beautiful patch of rainforest with his family and he is particularly passionate about parrots now in his local area he's super keen on seeing many of the calyptorhynchus species of black cockatoos but at home he's passionate about amazon parrots and has had amazing success as a parrot enrichment and behavior consultant and indeed has a business called parrot behavior and enrichment consultations his logo bird is a very cute cartoon gang gang cockatoo because he had an enormous amount of success with that species and the reason why i say that and i am focusing in on that bird is because many of you out there who are aviculturists and bird lovers will know that gang gang cockatoos are notoriously difficult to keep in captive circumstances they require an enormous amount of enrichment stimulation by way of good quality woody brows to chew up now jim would take on what other people would consider absolute lost causes as far as gang gang cockatoos go and he was able to restore all the gang gangs that came into his care to perfect feather he doesn't do it anymore because having a young family trying to keep up that amount of brows and enrichment to gang gang cockatoos is just not tenable but that just shows you the level of commitment that jim has i first met him through my work with the parrot society of australia where i used to collaborate there with another colleague and we used to write a supplement for the parrot society of australia's magazine called fledglings and it was a really great way to outreach to children and jim was really interested in this and shane and i working on that. Shane was a passionate school teacher who wanted to bring forward that kind of learning framework to children through the Parrot Society. Needless to say, when Jim and I realised what kindred spirits we are, we managed to just get a great understanding going and really good conversations and realised that we both were fascinated in the parrot brain and the way parrots go about living their lives. So we, in 2012, had a discussion and he said to me, why don't we get together and do a combined workshop so that's what we did and of course we had to call it something and behavior tech was the name we had that workshop in september of 2012 at corumban sanctuary we went for 30 people and we managed to get 52 so we had a really great fun couple of days of sharing all about learning the way behavior technology can enhance all of our lives now, on from that what happened was that jim getting increasingly busy with his commitments as a secondary school biology teacher and with his young family decided that he would go into the background more and behave more like a consultant in the situation however we did do a behavior text workshop for rspca queensland and of course then i went on to do the behavior text workshop for the asdk in auckland of 2013 and then later that year had the best time at wellington zoo doing a fortnight's worth of behavior tech workshops and that worked out amazingly well i had most incredible opportunities to witness and learn and grow through operating with all of the behavior techs there all of the professional learners we had a number of really great workshop sessions as well as a lot of on-site training sessions with everything from iguanas through to lions so for me it was an incredibly enriching experience on from that we also did a behavior techs double workshop over two nights at dubbo western plain zoo which was a arranged by another passionate behaviour nerd, Nick Hanlon, and that was also heaps of fun. It was in this capacity then that I was employed by Zoos South Australia to do a 
behavior consultations at Monato Zoo in the beginning of 2014, and then that led to my current job. So as the manager of nature theater at Adelaide and Monato Zoos, life is incredibly rich and very, very full. So at the moment, what Jim and I are doing is just making sure we stay in touch about behavior texts and keeping a diary of our observations and experiences so that throughout this period, we can keep on gathering information, keep on forming and growing, and then look forward to getting involved in putting a few more workshop concepts forward in the future. Very exciting. And if anyone listening ever gets an opportunity to engage with Behaviour Techs, Nick and Slash or Jim at any point, I highly encourage you to take it. Nick, sadly, we are nearly at the end of this podcast, but before we get there, I just want to ask one more question, a question that I ask all guests on the show, and it's a very important one, one that I can't wait to hear your thoughts and feelings on. Could you please tell everyone out there, what would you like to see happen in the next five to 10 years with positive reinforcement animal training, both internationally and in the Australasian region? I think one of the most essential things for our future success is to engage really meaningfully with our zoo leadership about the the importance of behavior programs and a uniformity of approach with the emphasis on positive reinforcement wherever we can possibly do it. It also would be really great for all of us when we have the privilege of being able to raise young animals to have agreement with each other about the methodology for the rearing of youngsters into our zoo networks. I think there's lots and lots of really great aids to helping us do this out there. Zins is an awesome area to record what we are doing with our animals, we therefore have the ability to create a lifelong log of interactions that we can furnish with an animal whenever it goes to its new situation. And so by networking, by staying in touch with each other, by making sure our records are great, we can fit that animal for a lifetime's worth of learning success wherever that animal may go. And if we have as much agreement about method as possible and seek as much guidance from skilled people as we possibly can, do our own research, get clear on the technology, also get increasingly clear on the terminology and how to apply it. What does this stuff actually mean? And how do we apply it to the situations we're in? Then we've got a chance of becoming increasingly unified. And I think unification of approach and technique is something that I'm really interested in. But I'm also interested in seeing people treating each other really well in our organizations. That is basically saying that charity begins at home in your own space. If you're interested in positive reinforcement, then certainly apply it to all of your animals. But I think it's ultra important to make sure that we treat each other really well in a reinforcing fashion. That we also remember that labels and constructs applied to people are just as misleading, misguiding and damaging potentially as labels slapped on animals. One of the things I think it's really important for us to focus on too is to remember that in our interactions with each other, particularly when we're negotiating around behavior, that there's a gap between stimulus and response. There always is this sliver of time and it might be the shortest period. We might dip into our decision bag spontaneously and just come back with something really fast and say something that we might later on regret or we could have put better or more effectively. And so for me, when we're thinking about this stuff, it's important to remember looking out for each other, treating your co-workers as you like to be treated is one of the golden rules, I think, of being really effective with applied behavior analysis. And remembering too, that if you're prepared to label, then you have to be prepared to describe and be really clear with each other. Remember, labels like dominance, one of the really biggies out there that gets used so a lot with dogs, needs a lot of careful unpacking. And we all need to realize that what we call dominance is just the animal responding in the present moment to whatever resources are available. So if we want to keep our seekers seeking, the major thing is this. Remember, it's about resources. What is in it for me to prosper, to do well in the present moment? And if we can actually fit in with that system, we're destined to have a lot of success with our animals. But if we're also prepared to work as a team with each other and to get our understanding 
our agreements, our technology aligned, then we have the most amazing world of enriched animal lives in front of us and incredible achievements for human animals as well. With my crew at Zoos SA, one of the best things for me that shows me a gratifying level of success is the fact that my guys constantly self-correct on the label front. Now, they'll say, now I'm going to label this and then I'm going to describe it. And I love that about them. One of the other things that I think is really needful is that if we're using these techniques with our traditional charismatic megavertebrates, mammals, certainly birds, it's also really good to be at the front line of research into how we can best apply these methods with other species that perhaps might not normally get the same kind of attention. And I'm talking things here like insects, uh, invertebrates of any kind, fish, certainly reptile species. It was really interesting to me recently when Valder Stellard was out from Columbus Zoo. He filmed a chameleon encounter whereby we've trained a couple of our chameleons to come out on cue onto a stand and have encounters with people. And it's a bestseller. Folk absolutely love it. And to see this amazing alien but elegant lizard climbing out onto this little stand and then being able to feed it is just such a great experience for people. He filmed this and he was very excited to take it back to the States where he showed it to a couple of his friends over there, especially like Steve Martin and Susan Friedman, and shared what's going on here with reptile training. So I'm sure in our network, we have many passionate reptile trainers who know that reptiles are just as interested in moving towards reinforcement as in any other kind of animal. So making sure that wherever we can, at every turn, we apply these techniques. And to also remember that training is completely pervasive. It's always happening. Behavior has no off switch, unless, of course, the animal has died, in which case it's no longer behaving. But while it lives, it is behaving. And so I'd like to place the emphasis for all of us on making sure that every interaction is a training session, that we don't just put those techniques aside and save them to those formal session times. We need to remember that every interaction is in some way influencing the future pathway of behavior. So in our husbandry practices and in our medical procedures, our veterinary interactions, there's so much that we can do to make sure that the animal is set up for a lifetime of success. Certainly as far as veterinary practice is concerned, I'd really encourage everybody to make sure as much as possible that they can bring their vet care staff to sessions to just generalize them into the animal's world. Many of us have stories to tell about animal response as to seeing the vet turn up in the animal's home area. Now, those strong responses, very many of them are based on aversive stimuli, needn't necessarily be the case. And this is where the next point comes in. It's important to actually negotiate with our leaders, our managers, and with each other to make sure that we make time in the day for the training to occur and be able to involve the people that are around us that will be relevant to the animal's life. Now, if we don't do that, we're going to have these little setbacks. We can't always rely on the strength of our trust account. I think it's important to place the emphasis firmly on getting everybody involved in the animal's behavioral lifestyle and making it as easy as possible to achieve the full suite of behavior that that animal is looking at. And to remember that we are lifelong learners, that being behaviors is our heritage as organisms, that all of us have not just the inborn right to explore this area, but indeed an obligation to ourselves, our success and our relationships with each other to be prepared to have a go, to get in there, to experiment and to use positive reinforcement to get that behavior seeking, to keep our seekers seeking in the target direction. So these are the kinds of things that I'd like to see more and more of. Just awareness at every angle of the value of positive reinforcement and what it can bring for getting not only really great learning performance, but ultimately the best, most enriched welfare outcomes for animals that we interact with. Thank you so much for those answers, Nick. And as I quite often, well, probably more than quite often, to be honest, will you find myself doing during one of these podcast recordings, I'm just sitting here nodding my head. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, yes, I absolutely love that. And let's hope that these things transpire. And additionally, because that was the last question, a massive, massive, massive thank you for coming on the podcast show, Nick. It's been so much fun and really glad that we could make this happen. So from myself and on behalf of everyone listening out there, gracias. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you so much for that. Hey, I hope you all enjoyed that as much as we always enjoy making these podcasts. Such great lessons in this episode. And after I push the finished record button, I'm going to go outside and watch some wild pigeons and let them teach me some new lessons about applied behavior and analysis. Additionally, make sure you visit the website to see all the other great podcast episodes on offer. You can download them all there and they're really great if you're a busy person as you can get them on your phone and listen to them whilst you're washing the dishes or driving to work or whenever you're on the go. Also, while you're on animaltrainingacademy.com, make sure to spend time consuming all the other free content I have for you there as well, including the 15 lesson training tidbits online course and the free live web classes. Hit the webinar button in the main menu and you can find out the dates of the next live free online events there. Make sure to get yourself along to one of those. For now though, that is it for us. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would love to know if you liked the episode or didn't like the episode. We want you to say hi, leave a comment on the website or on iTunes. I love to hear from you guys. Until next time, adios amigos. Mm -hmm.